Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs of Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. Before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. This week I am stamping my very first gorgeous stamp. I didn't buy this just now, but this was my first ever gorgeous stamp and I love this stamp line. These girls are so cute and so fun to color. I will be stamping her on a watercolor paper. This is about six by nine inch and it is a very textured watercolor paper. So I will stamp it two times at least and I will be stamping in my Misty so that I can stamp it more than one time. And I will stamp with VersaFine Clair Nocturne Black Ink. I am going to heat emboss it with clear embossing powder, which is something I usually do when I watercolor so that that embossing lines can create kind of little wells and I don't have to worry about coloring next to already wetted surfaces. All things considered, I think with this particular stamp, it would have been better to just stamp it, color it, and then heat emboss it afterwards, restamp it and heat emboss it afterwards because I'm using watercolor pencils today. Um, the pencils did have a little bit of a hard time getting into some of the nooks and crannies, especially in her hair, to lay down that pigment with the embossing lines, the heat embossed lines there. So just something I learned. Um, I will stamp this twice because, again, watercolor paper is very textured, and I need to make sure I get a nice crisp surface or image, rather, to stamp with. Um, I think that's all about the coloring. I did mention I was using watercolor paper or watercolor pencils rather. So I think that's all about the coloring. So let's go ahead and hop on into the crime. So our alphabetical journey this week takes us to the state of New Hampshire. The area of New Hampshire was part of the original territory of the United States it was originally included in the Charter of New England in 1620, but a separate grant established New Hampshire in 1629. In 1641, the area reunited with Massachusetts and then separated and reunited several times until it finally became a separate provincial government in 1741. The New, um, New Hampshire ratified the U.S. Constitution on June 21, 1788. It was the ninth of the original 13 colonies to join the Union. New Hampshire was the first to declare its independence of the 13 original colonies from Mother England. It declared itself free six months before the Declaration of Independence was signed. New Hampshire was the first state to have its own constitution, which was ratified in 1776, as soon as New Hampshire became a state. This was later replaced by the Constitution of 1784, and that constitution is still active today. New Hampshire is the only state where seatbelts are not mandatory. Scottish settlers in the Londonbury area um, first brought potatoes to America in 1719, and the potato is still New Hampshire state vegetable. New Hampshire became the home to the first ever known case of an alien kidnapping. It is one of the only nine states where the residents don't have to pay sales tax. New Hampshire has the longest running lottery in the U.S. The Cog Railway at Mount Washington is the world's first mountain climbing cog railway and is also the second steepest rail track in the world. New Hampshire had a few weird has rather a few weird laws like operating machinery is illegal on Sunday. Picking up seaweed is also forbidden. You may not sell the clothes that you are wearing to settle a gambling debt. And New Hampshire is the place of the tragic history of Ruth Blay. Ruth Blay was born to William and Lydia Chase Blay on June 10, 1797 in Haverhill, Massachusetts. She is listed as their eighth child. William and Lydia's fifth child is also named Ruth, but is listed as having died at the age of two. Um, details of her early life are sketchy, and there are some historians still looking into her life and her backstory. According to one source I found, Ruth lived with and worked with her family. 
Occasionally, Ruth was a school teacher or an interim school teacher, meaning that she held classes and taught students in areas all around her home, in homes or barns, because permanent school houses and permanent school programs did not exist in that area at that time. She often traveled between the towns that were then called Sandown, Chester, and Hawk. It was also reported that her mother was a seamstress and that Ruth at times also worked as a seamstress. It is unusual for the time, the late 1700s, for her to be so far into her late 20s, early 30s and not married, but that seems to have been the case. At some point in 1767, Ruth was working with her mother in Portsmouth, New Hampshire as a seamstress and discovered she was pregnant. At that time, she left her family and home and traveled south to Southampton and found a place to live with the Courier family. She began teaching their children and the neighboring family children in the Courier family barn. Now, I could not find many details about how she explained her growing belly and lack of husband. Um, eventually, her pregnancy would have been very hard to hide. And it made me wonder a little bit if the family she moved into was aware of her circumstances. However, she could have told him, told them rather that her husband was traveling and looking for work, or maybe she told him he was dead. We just don't know how she explained a pregnancy without a husband. Sometime on June 10th in 1768, on her 31st birthday, Ruth labored and gave birth by herself. No mother, sister, or friend to hold her hand, wipe her brow, or offer her a sip of the, quote, groaning beer that the women of her time would have prepared. Unsurprisingly, the baby girl was born stillborn. In her panic, Ruth wrapped the tiny body in cloth and brought it to the barn that, um, where she taught school that was on the property and hid the, the deceased baby under some loose floorboards. She said later that she intended to return when the shock and trauma had subsided and give the infant a proper burial. Then on the morning of June 14th, just four days later, a group of young girls converged on the barn for their school day to begin, and there the teacher Ruth awaited them. Once inside the barn, the girls noticed something amiss. The barn reeked. As they searched for the stench's source, they looked at the floor, and there through the cracks of the floorboards, they saw the body of a dead infant. Of course, the girls ran to get their parents, and the townspeople sprang into action. The women of the home examined Ruth's body for evidence of childbirth, but they didn't need proof. She confirmed the child was hers. The baby had been born four days earlier, dead upon delivery. Um, the coroner was called, and he disagreed. He wrote that the child came to death by violence. But here's the rub. Ruth was arrested and then indicted on one count of private burial and concealment of her fatherless child, a capital crime. She wasn't arrested for murder, even though the coroner claimed that the baby was born alive and then killed after its um, birth. Ruth was taken back to Portsmouth, where she spent uh, the hot days of the New Hampshire summer languishing in a rank, dark jail. And still, Ruth didn't name the father of her dead child. On September 3rd, her trial, to be, her trial not child, her trial began in Portsmouth. Much of Southampton, including the Clows, the family she lived with, testified. Ruth pled not guilty, but it didn't matter. She was convicted on that very day, convicted and sentenced to hang by a jury of men. Ruth's trial shook the town. The law at the time stated that concealment of a fatherless child, they use another word that I won't use because I don't want you to deflect me, whether or not it survived birth was a capital crime punishable by hanging, which is just weird. If you admitted you were pregnant and not married, you were shunned or run out of town or worse. But if you concealed the pregnancy, you were hanged. I mean, she was in this rock and a hard place that should not even have existed, even in the most 
religious of times. That is a ridiculous place to have to be. I guess the law about the concealment came into play because women who found themselves unmarried and pregnant could and did have the baby in secret and then pawned the baby off, left the baby to die, or even killed the child to avoid the stigma of being a, quote, loose woman and still be considered marriable. However, records indicate that the number of infant side convictions had dropped across New England in the recent decades. In the 17th century, juries believed that concealing a child proved guilt. That proved that no matter how you got pregnant, it was your fault and you were wrong. However, by the mid-18th century, the 1700s, where we are, juries were often swayed by it for a number of reasons. For instance, if a mother proved she prepared for the coming child by speaking to a midwife, preparing a crib, sewing clothes... It proved doubt. In order to prove that you were not trying to conceal this fatherless child, you had to prove you had begun making arrangements for the birth. So how would Ruth, a basically homeless, penniless woman, prove that? The judge set Ruth's, Ruth's execution for no, November 24th, 1768. Her only chance for survival was a pardon by Governor Benning Wentworth. For reasons not entirely clear, Wentworth gave her one reprieve after another, four in total, delaying her execution until December 30th. It is surmised that he was giving her time to, you know, um, come to terms with her maker, I guess is the phrase. When all this was taking place, the colonies were still under British rule and the ideas of the rev revolution were already raging. And it is likely that Governor Wentworth, the man who held Ruth's life in his hands, felt caught in the middle. The law that condemned Ruth was a British law and Wentworth was a British appointee sworn to uphold British law, no matter how he, what he felt, thought of the law. It is possible that he felt some pity for Ruth, which is why he gave her the four reprieves. Um, but all that did was delay her execution. It did not actually free her from this sentence. On December 23rd, just before Christmas, she got the final reprieve, and that did set her hanging date for December 30th. Ruth then spent her last night writing a statement in the presence of three witnesses most likely sitting shackled in the prison where she was kept for the previous five months. She stated her innocence until the end and still never named the father of her child. Would that have helped? Probably not. As the new year approached, Ruth renewed her defense in the town paper. Although her letter was called a confession, Ruth did not admit guilt. Instead, she argued her innocence Prior to Ruth and her trial, infanticide convicts confessed their crimes and begged for mercy. Ruth, however, constructed a counter-narrative to the one that was presented in court. In the letter, she said that she was incapable of murder. This is her a quote from her letter. Though I was with child, I never had a single thought of murdering the infant which makes me even shudder to think that it is possible any mother should be guilty of such cruelty. Then she went on to say, Therefore, I made preparations for its birth and could now produce the clothes and the women in whose keeping they are. But alas, it is too late. And on that unhappy day when I was delivered, I knew it had not been eight months from the time I was with child. Therefore, had not thoughts of being delivered at that time. But an unhappy fall, which I then received, brought on the birth instantly. So she knew she was pregnant. She began to make preparations. And according to her, the clothing that she made were in another woman's care. And um, she claimed in this letter to the newspaper that a fall triggered her labor. And that explains why and how the baby was born dead. Ruth explained in her letter that she hid the child in the floorboards out of shame and that she held back the truth under the advice of friends. 
Um, those friends are a mystery. She never named her friends either. Moreover, she claimed in her letter that witnesses in court misrepresented the facts and that some of them even lied. Ruth's declaration hinted at a larger conspiracy insinuating that something sinister occurred in Southampton that June. She wrote, and though I die with a forgiving spirit as to all my enemies, but charge the two women in particular to examine their own hearts as they will answer in another day, whether they do not come under the character of false witness and whether prejudice, jealousy, or something else has not drove them thus to bear false witness against me. So Ruth's accusations are very interesting. Curiously, they go against the grain of previous infanticide cases where women confessed and sought forgiveness. Here, Ruth lashed out at those she thought of as friends, claiming they had malice toward her. Why would two witnesses be jealous or prejudiced toward a spinster school teacher, seamstress, carrying a fatherless child? No one knows. But Ruth's accusations point at the unspoken question, who fathered the dead child? Although men could be tried for fathering an illegitimate child, in Ruth's case, no one was. Nothing breeds jealousy like illicit sex. And it is possible that Ruth had relationships with a vagabond or a traveling salesman. Um, romance, of course, tends to breed out of proximity. And no man was closer than the owner of the barn, Benjamin Clow. Two of the witnesses in Ruth's trial were Benjamin's wife, Olive, and his mother, Rachel. If Benjamin was the father, his female relations had much to lose. In a small community, impregnating the school teacher would bring shame, even ostracism, on the family. On the morning of December 30th, 1768, Sheriff Packer came for Ruth. She was collected by a horse-drawn carriage, and she was driven to the hill, probably with her wooden casket beside her. It is unknown exactly what Ruth looked like, because none of the reports talk about her weight, her height, her hair color, whether she was pretty, whether she was ugly. Nobody mentioned that, at least not in anything that I could find. She was most likely in distress, having spent the last five months-ish in prison, not to mention that she had been pregnant, pregnant um, had an early delivery, gone to jail, gone on trial, spent time in jail. I mean, she probably was not exactly the, the picture of health. Um, newspaper clippings say she was begging for a few more moments to live. Several hundred spectators had already assembled many of whom entreated the sheriff to delay the execution. He reportedly ignored the mob, loading Ruth into a cart, and then drove her to the execution ground. Dressed in a black silk dress, Ruth reportedly shrieked as the cart rolled through town. Just before noon, Sheriff Packer and Ruth arrived at the hanging grounds. Parker fastened her rope to a tree on the highest point of the pasture, set aside as an unused cemetery. So this place where they're executing her has already been labeled the town cemetery, yet nobody had ever been buried there. The hundreds of spectators continued to beg Parker to wait for a governor's reprieve. I, they full on expected him to send one, right? He had four other times before. Packer ignored them. He stood Ruth in the cart, placed the noose around her neck and tightened it. Then he gave the order his um, deputy sheriffs moved the cart along until Ruth's feet dangled in the air and she slowly strangled until she was dead. They buried her there, the first person in the cemetery in an unmarked grave. So there is a legend that Sheriff Packer refused to wait for a reprieve because his wife had already made his noon meal. And that night, a crowd stood outside the sheriff's home, burning a figure of him in effigy, chanting, am I to lose my dinner, this woman for to hang? Come draw away the cart, my boys, don't stop to say amen. Um, that's a pretty harsh claim against this poor sheriff, who in some ways didn't have any choice, right? Some historians claim that this is probably not true, that the sheriff didn't ignore the crowd because his meal was already getting cold. 
Um, but her death did inspire a great deal of sympathy and indignation in the following decades. And still now, Ruth became a folk legend and her innocence is believed by people still today. Most people believe she was innocent of the things she was convicted of. A man named Albert Layton, Albert Layton, sorry, words are hard, even wrote a poem about Ruth called The Ballad of Ruth Blay. Her innocence seems to be believed except by everybody or by most people except for the jury of men who convicted her in one day. Even Betsy Pettingill, who had been one of the schoolgirls that had found Ruth's child, believed she was gu not guilty. Betsy, Betsy reportedly later said that Ruth was more sinned against than sinning. Ruth Blay's hanging was the last hanging of a woman in Portsmouth and New Hampshire. Though the death penalty for the crime of concealing a fatherless child was not lifted until 1792. Ruth was buried in an unmarked grave, which lies about 300 feet north of the pond in the proprietor's burial ground, the cemetery that had not been used before Ruth's hanging. And those who think the sheriff Thomas Packer should have suffered for his crimes would be sad because he did not. He died in bed, a wealthy man at an old age, and his body was interred at the North Union Cemetery, where he still rests. Since we have a couple of minutes, I wanted to read to you The Ballad of Ruth Belay by Albert Layton. Um, it says it was published in 1859 for the first time. So here we go. In the worn and dusty annals of our old and quiet town, with its streets of leafy beauty and its houses quaint and brown, with its dear associations hallowed by the touch of time, you may read this thrilling legend, the sad tale of wrong and crime. In the drear month of December, 90 years ago today, hundreds of the village people saw the hanging of Ruth Blay saw her clothed in silk and satin, born beneath the gallows tree, dressed as in her wedding garments, soon the bride of death to be. Saw her tears of shame and anguish, heard her shrieks of wild despair echo through the neighboring woodlands, through the thrill of the clear and frosty air. When at last, in tones of warning from its high and airy tower, slowly with its tongue of iron told the bell the fatal hour. Like the sound of distant billows when the storm is wild and loud, breaking on the rocky headland, ran a murmur through the crowd. And a voice among them shouted, pause before the deed is done. We have asked reprieve and pardon for the poor misguided one. But these words of Sheriff Packer ring above the swelling noise. Must I wait and lose my dinner? Draw away the cart, my boys. Fold thy hands in prayer, O woman. Take at last thy, take thy last look of the sea. Take thy last look of the landscape. God be merciful to thee. Stifled groans, a gasp, a shudder, and the guilty deed was done. On a scene of cruel murder, coldly looked the winter sun. Then the people, pale with horror, looked in sudden awe behind, as a field of grain in autumn turns before a passing wind. For distinctly in the distance, in the long and frozen street, they could hear the ringing echoes of a horse's sounding feet. Nearer came the sound, and louder, till a steed with panting breath, from its sides the white foam dripping, halted at the scene of death. And a messenger alighted, crying to the crowd, Make way! This I bear to Sheriff Packer, tis pardon for Ruth Belay. But they answered not, nor heeded, for the last fond hope had fled, in their deep and speechless sorrow, pointing only to the dead. And that night with burning bosoms muttered crosses fierce and loud at the house of Sheriff Packer gathered the indignant crowd. Shouting as upon a gallows, a grim effigy they bore, be the name of Thomas Packer a reproach forevermore. Now there was not anything that I found in the history that suggested that a pardon did come in after Ruth's hanging. But it really does show that even 90 years later, people were still convinced that she had not committed a crime, especially a crime worthy of capital murder and 
or capital punishment and hanging. So let's talk about that for the last couple minutes of our video here. Where was the greater crime? Was the greater crime in Ruth in concealing not only the birth and the death of this child, but the name of the father? Or was the greater crime in the law itself? Or in those who carried out just the carried out the law in their own you know, they didn't, the judge didn't have any other law to go by. He only had this one law that was admittedly misguided and not everybody's favorite. But it really seems like Ruth could have been given an alternate ending. It seems like she could have been um, spared, especially because we don't know how her pregnancy came to be. Was this a pregnancy of her own choosing? Was the relationship with the man of her own choosing? Was she assaulted? We don't know that because she never told anybody because in her mind, it wouldn't have done any good. And she's probably right. Let's be honest. It probably would not have helped her and it could have harmed the father of her baby as well. Do you think it would have been different if she had had the child and the child had not been stillborn? or died shortly after birth. If she had carried that baby to term and delivered that baby alive, would Ruth's life have ended differently? You know, she still could have been ostracized and sent away from her town that she had, you know, spent the last few months of her life in. Her family probably would not have really welcomed her with open arms. So would that have been better? I don't know. I was attracted to this story because of all of those questions. I was attracted to the story because that law was really stupid, but also because legally there was a case against Ruth, but morally I disagree with that. So at the end of my painting, I did pull out my white gouache and add the white circles back into this dress. I was not about to try and paint around them. <laughs> and I had tried with a jelly roll pen, but it didn't really, it was too translucent. The, the white was not, um, thick enough, opaque enough. And I am going to add the whites to her eyes with the gouache as well. So leave me a comment down below. Tell me how you feel about the story. Tell me how you feel about the law. Tell me who you think actually was the criminal in our story today. Thank you so much for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed the story. I have a couple of other videos here I think you would like as well. I've also included a subscribe button. If you have not subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and have a really, really fabulous day.